Hello and welcome to the Story of Rivers, uh, a webinar series by the South East Rivers Trust. The South East Rivers Trust is a grassroots environmental charity dedicating to bringing rivers back to life across the South East of England. Uh, so this is episode nine in our series of webinars. It's going to be all about freshwater invertebrate life in our rivers. Uh, if you want to catch up on any of the previous webinars, then you can do so on our CERT River Club Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. Uh, so I'm going to pass over to David now to take you through the rest of the webinar. So my name is David Cornage. I'll be your presenter today. I've been working for South East Rivers Trust since January and prior to that working for other env environmental organisations across London, uh, specifically on freshwater issues. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about macroinvertebrates in freshwater ecosystems today. So generally a, a freshwater macroinvertebrate uh, is an invertebrate without a backbone, is an animal without a backbone uh, that's generally larger than one millimetre in size and covers a large number of, of animals that you'll see in, in, a, in a freshwater ecosystem. Um, I'm going to talk about the importance of freshwater invertebrates, um, how we monitor them with volunteers through the River Fly Monitoring Initiative, and then I'll go through some, but not an exhaustive list, of all the taxa uh, with some interesting facts about their ecology, behaviour and anatomy. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please go on to our Facebook comments below uh, and we'll try and do a Q&A with our panel of expert staff at some point soon. So I'm going to start by talking about um, their importance in the freshwater ecosystem. So they're a key group of species that support other taxa as a food source, as predators, and they also process nutrients that in, enter freshwater habitats uh, in the form of sort of leaf litter and other uh, organic particles. Uh, in the environmental sector, we use them as a monitoring tool uh, to give us an indication of the water quality or the habitat quality. Uh, this is because there are a large range of invertebrates that have evolved in different niches. So if they're present or not present in a certain habitat, that may indicate uh, that, that, that certain minor habitats are missing. Um, and also because they have evolved to be more, more or less resilient to certain changes in water quality, the presence or absence of certain species may indicate um, a heavily impacted water body. Um, they're often overlooked uh, by policy, in policy documents and by members of the public or seen as pest species, uh, that especially midges and mosquitoes. Um, however, they can actually be the predators of those pest species and keep them under control uh, and they are very beautiful. So if you see uh, a beautiful demoiselle sort of flittering over a, a water body uh, any time during the summer, that's arguably a very beautiful uh, image. And if you look at any sort of invertebrate under a microscope and just see the level of complexity, um, it, can be, it can be stunning to behold. So I'll look at the River Flood Monitoring Initiative. Uh, this is a national program that has been set up to monitor the state of our rivers across the UK. Um, so our volunteers got undertake monthly surveys uh, that help give us an indication of the water quality across a catchment and also across various months. Um, we also we record a subset of invertebrates such as cased and caseless caddisflies, uh, various mayflies called olives, uh, blue-winged olives, flat-bodied mayflies and mayflies. Um, we also look at stoneflies and freshwater shrimp. Um, South East Rivers Trust coordinate this, this project on the Beverly Brook, the Wandle and the Hogsmill. And uh, if you want to get involved in the future, then you can go onto the Get Involved tab on our website and sign up. There are also other volunteers, volunteering opportunities there as well. So when we talk about invertebrates, we often talk about their life cycles. And this is important because we need to discuss metamorphosis. Um, so generally invertebrates are split into uh, species that undertake hemiometabolism or hollow metabolism. So hemimetabolism is known as incomplete metamorphosis. This is the process that whereby uh, once an invertebrate is hatched from an egg, um, it exists as a, as a nymph, and this nymph generally gets larger and more developed um, over time, over several morts, with certain features becoming more distinct. And then if, once it's ready to mature into an adult, um, it will do so for, through various means. Um, hollow metabolism involves an extra step in which between the larval stages of the invertebrate and the adult stages of the invertebrate, there is a pupil stage whereby uh, the invertebrate goes through a dramatic change in its in its in its features. Um, this is most commonly known as the chrysalis, co commonly known by the chrysalis in butterflies, uh, but many other invertebrates undertake some form of pupation. So when we talk about invertebrates in freshwater ecosystems, we also talk about functional feeding groups. Uh, this is the means by which invertebrates consume their food. So we start off with scrapers and grazers. Uh, these, in, these, in, these species feed on a biofilm of algae and protozoans and bacteria and other organisms that exist on surfaces within the freshwater ecosystem. Uh, shredders, which will shred coarse organic material uh, until it becomes digestible. 
um, collectors which will actively move through a habitat to find organic material to, do, to, to consume and filters which will filter water um, and filter material and food items through through the water table. Um, and then predators will actively hunt and consume those other individuals. Uh, and this is important because it, it, these functional feeding groups vary depending on the type of habitat in the freshwater ecosystem, uh, the sort of habitat in the terrestrial areas surrounding a freshwater ecosystem, and they can actually change depending on the locate, depending on where you are in a river. So I'll start talking about the various invertebrates you find in a freshwater habitat by talking about the insects and specifically dragonflies and damselflies. These are two relatively sort of related uh, groups of insects known as Anisoptera for dragonflies and Zygoptera for damselflies. Um, they all have an extendable lower jaw known as a labium, which they use to catch prey. Um, they all have generally short antennae uh, and quite large eyes. Um, they go through incomplete metamorphosis. So as the nymph develops, uh, it has two wing buds, wing buds, which will grow larger and the eyes will develop. Um, they're mainly ambush predators uh, and you'll actually sometimes see dragonfly nymphs uh, ejecting water through their abdomen in a sort of jet propulsion. And on some occasions they can actually hover uh, in the water column as they pick off food items. Um, so dragonflies are generally broader and some species are, are shorter and stouter. Um, and they all have anal spines at the end of their abdomen. Uh, the zygoptera are generally thinner, um, tend to be smaller than, than most dragonflies, uh, and they have three plate-like uh, plate -like external gills known as caudal lamellae on the end of their abdomen. Now I'm going to talk about mayflies. Uh, the nymphs of these insects have medium length antennae, external gills, and three tail-like appendages at the end of their abdomen known as cerci. They go through incomplete metamorphosis, so the nymph grows larger over time, and they only have a single wing bud, which will develop as the wing as the uh, nymph matures. Uh, once the nymph is ready to uh, mature into an adult, they will mature from the water surface directly, uh, and that will emerge as a sort of immature version of an adult known as the margot, and then as a final malt until the mayfly becomes a full adult. Um, they're known as ephemeroptera because of the ephemeral nature of the adults. They tend to live for a very short period of time, and they, they mate on large, in large masses of insects uh, and through a process known as lek polygony, uh, where a large number of males will collect in an area and then females will converge to mate with them. Um, they're all herbivorous uh, and some have evolved tusks that allow them to burrow into silt and sand, um, which kind of changes their appearance somewhat. So now I'll talk about stoneflies. Uh, this is another group of insects uh, that have long antennae, large mandibles, and they are dorsoventrally flattened. Uh, so that means that the, the back, they are flattened sort of between the back and the belly, and their legs tend to sort of splay out to the side. Um, these insects have two long tails uh, called cerci, which can make them difficult to identify um, compared to mayflies, especially because these tails uh, can be easily damaged when, when collected. Um, they also go through incomplete metamorphosis, and the nymphs of these uh, insects will actually crawl onto the side, the bank of a water body, to develop, which can actually make them quite prone to be predated on by fish as they sort of collect on the edge of a, of a pond or a lake or a river. Uh, they can be herbivorous and they can feed on benthic algae that, that you'll find on the bottom of a water body, but other species are active and voracious predators that feed on other invertebrates. Um, and the adults, when they're ready to mate, the adults will actually drum or scrape their, their body um, on a surface like a stone or a leaf or a piece of wood uh, to attract each other. So moving on to the final hemipermetabolist uh, group of insects that I'm going to talk about today, uh, the true bugs. So this is a, a large group of insects that have a lot of different forms. Um, so I, I've included an image of a water boatman in the bottom middle of the screen and a water scorpion on the, on the right hand side. Um, and there are also groups like water striders, uh, terrestrial versions, maybe sh are shield bugs and assassin bugs, uh, and they can have a lot of different sort of forms to the to the actual spe between species. Um, generally, they have mouth parts that are fused into uh, into something known as a rostrum, which they use to pierce either a, a plant and suck the sap through or digest the plant tissue, or they pierce an, anim an animal and it release enzymes that will digest the animal's tissue or in some cases actually suck on the blood of the animal. Um, these, uh, these insects go through incomplete metamorphosis. So as, as, as before, the, the nymph will develop and grow slightly larger over time, over successive molts until it, it emerges into an adult. Um, most true bugs, 
true bugs um, are air breathing. Um, and so what they'll do is they'll actually um, breathe out of various orifices um, above the water surface, which means that they're less prone to changes in water qualities than some of the previous insects. So sometimes if you have um, a negative uh, change in water quality, you might still get large numbers of true bugs present. So when we do those surveys, we need to make records of those sort of factors. Um, so I'll move on to the, um, the hollow metabolist insects and start with caddis flies. Um, so this is a group of insects that are generally split into cased and caseless species. Uh, the case species use a waterproof silk uh, to collect uh, detritus and other objects to form a case around themselves. Um, some species have anal hooks, which they use to grasp onto substrate with various uh, hair-like um, structures known as setae. And they generally have small eyes, uh, rectangular heads, and then the caseless species have, hard, have hardened segments of their thorax, so the, the three segments you can see behind the head. Um, they go through complete metamorphosis, uh, so the cased uh, individuals will actually uh, use the case as a cocoon, so they'll, 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 they'll com complete the case and actually metamorphosize uh, within the case. Um, and during that process, they'll undulate their body so, they, so water can still move throughout their case and they still get enough oxygen. Um, there are a variety of feeding styles. Some are more active feeders, uh, but some spin sort of silken nets that they sort of um, splay into the water column until food items are captured by those nets. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the larvae that live in running water bodies will often use heavier components uh, in their cases to increase their weight and actually make it harder for them to be pushed down a, a flowing water body. So next I'm going to talk about beetles. Uh, this group of insects have a, a, a very large variety of forms, uh, but generally the larvae have a hard and distinct head and the adults have a hardened forewing known as an elytra. Uh, these insects go through complete metamorphosis, um, some fully aquatic, some others not, uh, and almost all pupate terrestrially, even if they have an aquatic larval and adult stage. Um, they fit a variety of niches from active predators to algae grazers and detritivores. Um, some interesting facts include the fact that the whirligig beetle, which you often see skimming along the, the surface of uh, water bodies in the UK, um, have horizontally separated eyes so they can see um, above and below water the same time without any significant distortion um, and other adult species other groups of adult beetles will actually form small bubbles of air um, around their bodies uh, that they can breathe through so next i'll talk about true flies um, this is a very large group of insects that have many forms um, so they're known as sort of phantom midges or mosquitoes or black flies or horse flies or non-biting midges um, generally, the, the, they are adipose and have no jointed legs, although some have pro legs, which are present. Uh, sometimes they have distinct heads, others less so, and others th that will retract into their bodies. Um, they all go through complete metamorphosis. So in the illustration below, you can see um, two of the two versions of pupae uh, of these insects that will sit in the water column and, and pupate and develop into, into adults. Um, Chironomid midges uh, sometimes have a hemoglobin-like molecule in their blood, which uh, and we call them blood worms, which makes them more able to, to deal with lower levels of dissolved oxygen in the water column, which means that if you have a, 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 an environment which is quite heavily impacted by human activity, um, sometimes you'll find very large numbers of, of true flies with the absence of other species. Um, and all adults of true flies uh, have one pair of wings and the other pair has sort of evolved into a gyroscop gyroscopic balancer, which makes them excellent flies. So next I'll talk about crustaceans. Um, again, this is a very, very large group of ver invertebrates and I only have time to talk about them on one slide. Um, some of the forms include um, freshwater shrimps or the amphipods, uh, the isopods like the water hoglouse or the decapods uh, like crayfish, freshwater crayfish. Um, they have a, and this also includes sort of fleas and copepods and other, other, other crustaceans. Uh, many undergo metamorphosis and all develop through a larval stage called anorpolis which has uh, sort of two appendages on the head, which helps with uh, locomotion and moving. Um, and actually many, um, many larval stages of crustaceans look dramatically different from one another. And so several stages of the, the crab development have actually been, were in the past mistaken for completely different species. Um, many are predators, but others are keystone species like fleas and copepods, which will exist in the, the water column in very, very large quantities. 
So we go on to uh, leeches now, which are uh, segmented worms that have a container hydrostatic skeleton, which is essentially a series of water, flu water fluid filled chambers uh, that alter shape as, as the fluid moves around the body. Um, they have oral and caudal suckers, which allow them to move across surfaces and they will free swim. Uh, the oral suckers generally have three jaws that sort of are shaped like a Y and it, for those parasitic species that sort of feed on uh, the blood of, of, of an animal then they'll make quite an obvious and distinct incision in the animal's skin or on the animal's um, outer body. Um, they're all hermaphrodites uh, but must mate sexually um, so once they've mated they'll, they'll use a cocoon to enclose and shelter their eggs. Um, some, of, some species will actually entwine themselves around this cocoon um, to protect it and then in some cases the new newly emerged juvenile leeches will actually form a small crash on the adult leech leech um, until they're ready to to move on to a host or or, or exist further in the environment um, uh, so yes they sometimes feed on mollusks and others parasitize wildfowl fish or aquatic mammals so i'll move on to free living flatworms uh trichlodina uh, this is a group of non-segmented worms uh, that you'll find in many freshwater bodies, uh, slightly, often much smaller than leeches. Um, they generally have um, eye spots known as ocelli on the end of their heads. Um, these can be um, in different patterns or slightly different colours, and they're just basic means by which they can detect changes in light quantities reaching their heads. Um, they move across a bed of mucus on small hair-like structures known as cilia. Um, they're omnivorous and use a sort of a ba basic pharynx um, to consume food. Uh, they can re reproduce asexually and sexually, um, and sometimes this changes in certain species depending on the temperature of the environment that they're in. Um, those, those individuals that, that mate sexually uh, develop um, eggs inside their body in capsules, and then they shed those capsules when they're, once, they're ready to, once they're ready to hatch. Uh, and then those that develop asexually will actually split from head to tail and then two in, and then two individuals will, will grow from those two separate halves. So finally I'm going to talk about mollusks. Uh, this group is, is generally split into bivalves and gastropods. Uh, gastropods include sort of snails, whelks, um, slugs and limpets and then the bivalves include clams, mussels, oysters and cockles as well as other, other groups. Um, they all have a large muscular foot uh, which is used for locomotion in gastropods and is used uh, for digging, generally for digging in bivalves. Uh, and so gastropods have a, a single large shell uh, that sits on their back that they can then retract themselves into for protection. Bivalves have a, a shell that has been split into two valves, uh, which is uh, connected by a elasticated hinge of protein. Um, and some gastropods have operculums that act as lids on the, end, on the face of their shells, uh, which they can use for protection and we can use for identification. Um, many species of detritivores, others graze algae and diatoms from surfaces in the freshwater environment. Uh, some bivalves are filter feeders and others will parasitize fish by um, attaching to their gills, for example. Um, some mollusks have gills, others have lungs and, uh, and breathe air, and some have both, uh, which again, like many others that are quite capable of breathing air, other species that are quite capable of breathing air means they're more resilient to changes in water quality in a freshwater environment. Uh, and then some aquatic snails can, interestingly enough, actually crawl along the, um, the, the underside of the surface of a water body uh, using the water's tension. And that is uh, sometimes how they um, move around the environment. So that's as much as I'm going to talk about with, with freshwater invertebrates today. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, then please type them below because uh, they'll help shape our future webinars and we can do Q&A sessions in the future. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Next time on the Story of Rivers, we're going to be looking at water resource management. So where the water that comes out of our tap comes from uh, and how we can make sure that there's enough for both people and wildlife. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Story of Rivers and um, we will see you again soon.